I'm Flint Weaver with the R Weaver Egg Dairies. I'm a bee and queen producer and well wisher. Thank you. Hey, my name is Take Chances. E.T. Ash. Uh, my name is E.T. Ash. Uh, I keep bees in College Station, Texas. I'm also the uh, chief apiarist at Texas a and Bee Lab. Started keeping bees in 1962. Uh, pretty much self-taught, went to work for a commercial beekeeper in about 1984 uh, with main purpose that I was going to teach myself how to raise queens. Uh, about 2000 I started keeping bees again and I uh, raised a few nukes, a few queens, a little honey, uh, try to get the seeds at the a &B lab, good advice from time to time and, uh, and, uh, and, and I'm Glad y'all could show up and ask us some good questions. Uh, my name is Art Thomas, and I'm a newcomer to Texas. I've been here about 15 years. And my beekeeping experience is most in the West and in Canada. Kept uh, bees both places. And I'm a bee breeder. Uh, first time I was in the bee yard was around 1955. I was six or seven or eight years old, and I was catching queens with my dad and my grandparents. Uh, I've been doing it a long time and I know very little. Uh, I'm learning all the time. You know, it's a steep learning curve if you want to do bees. It's a very steep learning curve. So I'm glad to be here and answer any questions I can. Thank you. Danny. Daniel Weaver, Bee Weaver Apiaries. I'm about 10 years arts junior. And, uh, <laughs> My dad had me out in the Queen Yard catching queens on Saturday mornings after he decided I'd watch too many cartoons when I was about nine years old. So, doing it off and on since then. Dr. Delaplane doesn't need an introduction. No. Keith Delaplane versus Georgia, yeah. study bees and pollination and queens. Okay, so who's going to start us off with a question? I love it. Every session has looked blank until somebody had the courage to put their hand up. Yes, sir. towards sideliner to commercial set, you know, raising 30, 40 queens. What would be your advice to somebody who has 10 colonies or so to start on that process? Okay, the question is, most people that breed queens do 30 plus. What happens if you just want some, a few? Okay. I might be the only person qualified to answer this question. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Go ahead, E.T. No, don't take me seriously. Uh, so you're at the point where you're just learning how to raise queens and of course to me it always falls into two classifications one is raising queen cells the second is to get them into a nuke and get them mated and the two things are totally separate uh, I mean at least me I separate them in my mind so you're at the point where you have the minimum resources you have to figure out a way to raise queens with those few resources you're not like Clint or Danny where you're raising these by the thousands, which is kind of the economic threshold for it. Um, so, I mean, it's like you're, you're, which doesn't mean you can't produce a few big queens, you can sell them to the local, into the local market. Uh, but uh, you probably want to investigate cloak boards, which is a fairly de resource and expensive way to raise queen sales. Uh, if you try to do it the way Clint does or, or the way Danny does it, or for that matter, the way I do it with swarm boxes, you, you don't have the bee resources to really pull that off, okay? So you need to probably look in using a cloak board uh, to conserve your resources as much as you can. And E.T., I think you're going to have to explain what a cloak board is. Okay, a cloak board is a process where where you take a double-bodied hive and you make one half of the hive queenless. So you're, so it, it essentially means that rather than making, starting queen cells off by the hundreds, you're probably starting them off like 15 or 16 at a time. Uh, and so you start them off, you, you have one, this, most people do it in double deeps. Uh, you have a cloak board in between which shuts the hive off one side from the other, one side you create a queenless. Uh, you start the cells off from there, then you pull the cloak board off, which reunites the hive 
which means that you haven't really used a lot of bee resources in the process. But the limitation is you, you can only raise a few queens at a time versus large numbers. So Won't they then swarm when you rejoin the hive? No. Okay. Now, what do you pull the cells out before they get to that point? <sighs> Sorry, obviously. Did you want to add anything else? You raise how many queens in a year? Uh, I'm art and I raise a thousand, maybe two thousand. Oh, it's I, more than I thought. Okay. Yeah, I don't know, but uh, the basics are the same. To raise queens, you got to have young bees, and you got to have a good unit. I don't care whether it's two frames or ten frames. There's got to be a lot of bees in there. Uh, it takes young bees to raise queens. So, uh, you know, there's 50 different ways to raise cell builders. There's queenless cell builders, there's starters and finishers. I'm such a small outfit that I just, I do it real simply. I take a couple frames of brood and five or six pounds of bees and I raise 50 queen cells. And they're, they're good queen cells, but I only use them once. And then I, I take my cell builder and make it into new boxes. I put queen cells in it. Uh, but there's many ways to do it, but the basics are the same. You have to have lots of bees to feed the queen cells, and you, you have to have lots of pollen in there uh, for the young bees to eat, not to the, the virgin queens, but uh, young bees are what produce the royal jelly. So the basics are the same, big healthy units. Yeah, that's all very helpful stuff. Um, remember to begin when the bees are going to make it easy on you. So do it when they're on a pollen flow. Do it when the colony's growing in population. And don't forget drones. Don't ever try to raise queens unless you have drones. And lots of them. Keith, did you want to add anything? Not really. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. Go ahead. Is uh, for you guys that's doing this on a mass scale, is there any uh, tricks or anything to try to step up the process to do it on a mass scale than, of course, small sideliner? Um, yeah, I mean, I think the most important thing to remember if you're really crazy enough to want to be a commercial queen breeder is you're going to have to make efficient use of your bee resources. You have to be very, very good at milking all the productivity possible out of every colony and out of every need. So it'll make you a better beekeeper. In fact, even just trying to raise 10 queens on your own once or twice will make you a better beekeeper. It's worth, it's worth doing, uh, if for no other reason than that. Sorry. Can I can't, 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 can't be afraid to fail. You've got to be patient, and you've got to be determined. And crazy, like Dan said. You've got to be a little crazy. To One thing I might add is bee breeding, raising queens is all about organization. Uh, Dan, Daniel touched on it. No use raising virgin queens if there's no drones. Uh, no use raising cells if you don't have nukes to put them in. So projecting your thinking of what a beehive is going to do is very important. You, you have to know on the 15th of January if they're making pollen that your hives are going to increase in the middle of February. There's going to be a bee population. There's going to be young bees. So most bee breeders start breeding when there's a pollen source sometime in, in February. If they're making pollen in January, you need to project your thinking into February that your hives are going to be better. So it's all about organization when you're raising a lot of them. You know, your breed queen's got to be good, your cell builder's got to be good, your colonies have to be good, and the nukes you split have to be good. You know, you take any one of those out of the equation and you're going to fail. I don't want to hide the mic. But you don't find any if you have things to say. So, um, and the other thing is, I'm going to circle back again. 
drones. Okay, if you're going to start in Queens in the springtime, remember that when that virgin queen is five or six days old, she's going to leave the nuke or leave the hive to go make. You have to have mature drones at that point for her to make with. And it takes a while for a drone to become mature enough to be effective. So and if they take how long? Who knows? How long does it take to go from egg to adult for a drone? 24 days. 24 days. Okay? So you're saying that, it's, okay, so once you start seeing purple eyed drones in your eyes, so you know you got a drone population coming out. Yeah, don't you, you wait don't. until they have actually already hatched before you start growing? drawing your uh, larvae out and grafting? There you go. There's a man that's thinking ahead. That's exactly the right recipe. You need to have adult drones. They don't have to be old, but you need to have adult drones in your hive, and not just one or two of them, okay. before you start grafting. So then, that then once the drone actually hatches, all right. Emerges. How long emerges. emerges drone? Emerges. Emerges, what are you gonna say? It, how long do you, you have to wait before it's actually reached its maturity to make? So you got your you got your twenty eight days and you or twenty four days and then you got what, another week? Well, All right. who, who knows who, who, who knows? Here's an important lesson for you. Art's gonna tell you. All right, you got to know how long it takes to go from freshly grafted larva to a virgin queen. Okay, we've already talked about how long it takes for a drone to become an adult, but then factor in how long it takes for that drone to become mature. Okay, so, so that's the basic arithmetic right there. So, Danny, you're actually going to put what drone comb in so that you actually produce a lot of drones? Sure, I mean, that can't hurt, but. Um, colonies are going to raise drones when it's time for them to raise drones. I mean, that queen is going to hunt out the drone comb in your colony. Unless you have all perfectly drawn, brand new, fresh combs on plastic foundation, you're going to have some drone comb. And the queen's going to go find it when it's time for her to start producing drones. I, I understood that the drones that I raise in my apiary will not be the drones that the queen from that same apiary may do. And they fly further. Yeah. So it's really my neighbors, I'm really depending on the drone supply in my neighbors and not my drone supply. I can comment on that. A lot of that research came from two places, one of which was Russia in the 1930s, and then later some work in USDA was concerned about African bees, and they were trying to figure out how can we raise European queens in an African area. So a lot of that research came out of there. But that has been um, superseded, if I may use that word. Um, <laughs> some better understanding of how drone congregations actually work, and they are vast utterly fast and they each one of them will draw from drones from a scale of miles and they can contain drones from up over 200 colonies so essentially it's probably a tempest in a teapot when it boils right down to it over should i have my drones so many distance from there because in reality um, the drone congregation areas are very efficient at drawing from all available drones within that breeding population which is a good thing I mean, it's, it's one of the things that nature is kind of taking care of on its own without our concerning. And it's also comforting to know that this is an adaptation against bad matings. If you are a virgin and you're in the neighborhood of your own colony, yes, you probably will mate with some of your brothers. But the fact that they mate multiply is one of the, that's one of the reasons why they mate multiply. So that it doesn't really matter. She made up to 20 drones and she can afford for one of them to be her brother. So this is, I think, literally it's not really not worth worrying about. Um, you do want a lot of drones, you do want a lot of diversity of drones from your area, but, but worrying yourself over much about their distances between the mating yards and the drones is probably super, superfluous. Okay, I've got the temerity to try to add something to that. Uh, I, I do think it's important that you have lots of colonies. 
if you're going to be successful in rearing queens. Because the more colonies you have producing drones, then the less likely it is that that virgin queen you've reared from one of those breeders that you grafted from is going to mate with one of her brothers. Can you quantify lots of colonies? <laughs> I, I, you know, I'd be hesitant to attempt to mate queens in an apiary, even if I was only going to mate a handful of queens, if I had fewer than 10 colonies. I'd, I'd rather have 20. Yeah. Or 40. Yeah, that's, not, that's not necessarily your home. That's in the area, correct? Right, right. Yeah. So if you got a house two miles down the road that's got five and you got five over here, that's just a Samaritan. Yeah, and don't forget feral colony density because that's often overlooked. And feral colony density in Texas is quite high. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Landscaping is important, knowing what the floor resources are. And again, don't try to raise queens unless you know your colony is really productive and is on a pollen flow. But you'd be amazed how many colonies are out there, even in places that you think of as being a desert. I mean, yeah, I, I haven't quantified you know colony density in your area, but I know in our backyard, we figure we must have you know 10 to 20 colonies per square mile just living in the trees. That's lots. Yeah, it's just so heavily forested. There's not much sunlight that gets thrown. Yeah. So, I know they're there. I mean, there's not like I'm just concerned about it. And of course, that, that has changed over time. There have been periods in the recent past when there were very, very few feral colonies. So the kind of trees you have there can make a difference. So, so if you're in a if you're in a heavily pine forested area, you're kind of you are kind of in a desert for bees. Uh, hardwoods, river bottoms, riparian strips, because things that flower are a little bit different situation than a pine tree. Uh, but yeah, you have to be kind of aware of what your geography yeah, is. That's the concern. Google fun. Earth is a wonderful uh, mechanism for looking at things a little bit larger. Yeah, but you know, in March and April, you're going to be fine. Okay. Yeah. I, I have no shortage of pollen all year long. Yeah. The, the, the <coughs> okay, who's next? Yes, sir. Do you all buy uh, queens from other parts of the country from time to time to put genetic diversity, or those drones come from miles around and said, uh, I mean, I worry about some of mine are fourth and fifth generation in my yard and the question is do we buy queens over the, from other over parts the years of the country? We've bought bees over the decades we bought bees from different sources and things are working out just fine. Well, because you did that or because I did it? if you hadn't done it. We'd be just fine. <coughs> So I would say I, 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 I buy bees from various sources and it's, it's basically a matter of one, testing out suppliers to see the quality of the product that they're producing and two, to maintain some degree of genetic diversity or some aspect of that particular kind of bee that you want to incorporate into your resisting apiaries. Uh, so, so yeah, I bought queens from California, Hawaii, uh, Florida. Um, sometimes people's reputation is larger than the quality of the product <coughs> that you receive. Uh, I would add one thing to Danny's comment about, you know, raise a few queens, it'll make you a better queen breeder. Uh, you raise a few queens, and it'll make that 30 to $40 queen seem a little cheaper than you <laughs> thought it was. Uh, Keith, do you want to add something from... Any kind of things that go wrong, you'll kind of... 
Oh. Give you a new appreciation for me. That might be the cheapest thing you're buying this week. So, Keith, from an academic sure. point of view, what does this make sense or doesn't? Uh, it? Yeah, it, this is a perfect time for me to just kind of jump in on, on the research we've been doing on. And those of you who attended my lectures on this subject will, will be a, a review for you. But um, we have been very keen in the last few years on the Queen's mating number, and there's lots of people working on this. It's not I have. I don't have a monopoly by any stretch, but the, the data are really overwhelming that the, there's a strong correlation between the colony strength and the number of mates that the queen has, how many males she mates with and stores their sperm, and it all generates this highly diverse colony. And a lot of times I get the question, kind of what was just raised, um, you know, the people ask me, you know, do I, should I get a queen from you know, California one year, and Texas the next year, and Florida the next year, and Georgia the next. And, and I always say, no, you really need to get your queens from Georgia every year. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously, but, and, but, but and I appreciate what the question is saying, and you're, you're, you're almost there, but not quite, because the point that we're really getting at is the diversity in that queen spermatheca, which is kind of a whole different can of worms. And you can bring in a lot of diversity from here and there, but getting the queen to mate with a lot of those males is, is kind of the, the next qualitative jump in the challenge here. And um, so it raises the obvious question, well, what is the answer? Instrumental insemination? And yes, but that's not very practical <coughs> on, on a large scale at least. Um, it is possible to breed for promiscuous queens. And this is something I would, I would like to see the industry actively work at, because we know that it's heritable. And you can kind of select for hussy behavior. Um, besides, imagine the marketing potential. <laughs> turn, turn your imagination loose on that one. So, um, no so there's, a, yeah, there, there's a real possibility there, I think. Um, and another thing that we're working on right now, which is a little odd, uh, he, was a, he was an inspector for the state of Arkansas one year. He was talking to me about this, and we have actually turned his idea into a funded grant that I'm doing right now with Auburn University and the University of Delaware in, in Wheat, Georgia. And that is the, the merits of mixing brood. Because when you think about it, if you move brood around, that is simulating the effects of polyandry, at least temporarily. You, you, you make a big mix, you bring a lot of brood into one colony, and roughly 21 days later, you've got a huge hugely polyandrous population. Now you can think of it as a wave, and that wave is going to peak and then dissipate over time. But during that interval, you might have a really robust colony that's strong for like nursing behavior and resisting mites and pathogens. So we're trying to look at other ways that beekeepers can um, incorporate the benefits of polyandry, but I do think it is a really untapped area of resource and our latest research has shown a positive synergy between pre-selected traits like VSH and polyandry. In other words, if you can take VSH drones and incorporate polyandry, make your virgins with, in our case, 54 VSH drones, that you get an augmented efficacy against Varroa. It's like 2 plus 2 is 5. And I think that's exciting. I think it's practical. And I think it's largely untapped. We can we can make some improvements there and be green in that area. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Where am I looking? There's a hand. Here. All right, Matt. So you you are uh, recommending the promiscuous behavior, but you don't see that as a marketed behavior at this time. Are there some sources that you can direct us to? Well, the trouble with it is um, it's. it's technologically difficult. On the back end, you can genotype your workers and find out after the fact how many males their mother mated with. And that's a possibility, and that's, that's doable. On the front end, we're kind of stuck with instrumental insemination as a possibility. But we do know, um, from many labs, again, not just me, we do know that when you have really polyandrous queens, virtually every measure of productivity goes up, including varroa resistance. Wow. So, okay. In addition to the productivity increase you get with the whole management you said, do any of you gentlemen uh, selectively buy specific species of queens, like trade owners or Russians, to 
for doing it. We noticed an increase in productivity with those different species. I'd like to see the chart from the table that says one's more prolific than the other and one's more common. Um, okay, well, I'll take a step at that. First of all, let's bear in mind that all honeybees are one species. Okay? So there's nascent, maybe subspecies, categories, and beyond that, it's mostly just a strain difference. Although, I for one happen to have a population of honeybees that exhibits genotypic markers for Apis mellifera mellifera, Apis mellifera lagustica, Apis mellifera caucasica, and Apis mellifera scutellata. So, I, I, I care about diversity very much. I spend a lot of time working on that. And I, I don't think it's, um, I think it's been part and parcel of our success in being able to produce queens that are more resistant or more tolerant of varroa mites than most others. Because we do care about diversity and we try to work very hard about that. I also bring in queens from other queen breeders, but for a slightly different reason. I like to evaluate my own performance by comparing the quality of my own stock against some of the other commercially available lines. And when I'm buying colonies or nukes of bees from other beekeepers, I'm bringing in varroa mites from other parts of the world so that I can be sure that I'm not just selecting for weak need mites, that I truly am selecting for bees and queens that can tolerate mites. Want to add anything? I, I would add this point to it, which is that uh, you can also bring in tra traits that you think are useful. I mean, this is more like a talk talking about populations versus individuals. So we're not talking about buying one or two queens. We're talking about <coughs> buying 50 or 100, some significant number. So, for example, several years ago, uh, I decided to go away from using any kind of chemicals. I had been trained by a commercial beekeeper to dose hives twice a year with teramycin sugar mix for, to suppress EFB, AFB. So uh, when I decided that I was going to halt using these products, I, I, I purposely brought in a significant amount of Minnesota hygienic uh, material because they they had to, so it was kind of a hedge against any kind of negative effects if the teramycin decision doing away with teramycin decision was poor. So you can bring in certain kind of aspects of something that you want to select for or or against in this case. So. Uh, so yeah, I, I have done that on a purposeful basis, but it was to basically get away from any kind of chemical treatment in the hives. When you start building, what is your start timeline and what is your stop timeline? I mean, time of the year. Understand what I'm saying? When do you start building queens and when do you stop? It, it depends. Sorry. <laughs> so I would say, Jim, as a general for this area, uh, my planning on starting Queen Mary starts about January 1st, uh, which means I'm checking feeding. Uh, part of my bias is that I'm not so much into selection as I am into culling. Uh, so. I mean, I don't have the kind of background that Clint or Danny has where I, where I have grandfathers that selected. So my weakness is, is I'm not that good at selection, but I can call at a pretty heavy rate and whatever's left is what I use. So I start in January. Usually by about the end of May, I've stopped. Although, you know, at some level you're, once you get into this game, you're kind of going, going, going go months of the year and you get a little break in here sometime, but essentially January to May is kind of my timeline. So the question you're asking is when do we start grafting? Yeah, when, when do you fire up start breeding? I, I try this year to grow my own 
I mean, I started drafting this year. I drafted some in March, and turns out I got a couple of 35 degree nights, and they didn't do too good. Right. Well, uh, you're going to have those nights if you start early. We typically wait until we see emerging drones. We might, I mean, we, we might wait till we see some, uh, an abundance of drone brood in a bunch of colonies. And I think we started around the 26th of February this year. And that's typical. I, I like to go a little later, but you know, sometimes you just gotta start before you think you're ready. But you're, you're down this way, I'm further north, so a week later, two weeks later. How far back? Give or take. How much further north? Ken. Kansas? Ken. Oh. <laughs> yeah, I, would, I would tell you the two, I would say at least two or three weeks later, actually, a little further. Pollen, when, they, when the pollen starts coming in, you'll see your elm pollen in, in January. Uh, they're going to start, and then you get into February, and you're probably going to have some really cold days. Just wait until, just wait until they start raising brood. Are, are you going? Are you talking small scale, large scale? Medium. Eighty, 80 something, eighty, ninety hives. What I'm sitting on now. Okay. Just. I mean. Here, here you go. When do you want to have mated queens? First mid-April. Oh, you got it made then. Uh, you can start grafting in March. There's a discussion on time scale up here. Okay. So we have an agreement. Dallas. 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 <laughs> so I would say that um, based on where you are, you're going to be, I would think, April 1 is going to be as early as you could possibly get yeah. good mated queens. Yeah. Now you can get queens, but you can't get good mated queens until about the 1st of April. So back in my father's day, when I first started paying attention to Queen Ray, and I would sit around the breakfast table with him and he'd be talking to me about what they were going to be doing today, there was a rule of thumb. And that was that we could be grafting by the 20th of February. But that was the good old days. And we are way past the good old days. We have not had the ability to start grafting by the 20th of February any year in the past 30 years except this one. I haven't started before the 1st of March, but once in the past 10 years, this one. Because the impact of Climate change and climate variability on beekeeping has been acute, especially in this part of the world. And plants are blooming at different times, bee colonies are responding at different times. It's rare that we have drones emerging before the first of March, and you're further north. Okay? So you, you've really got to pay attention to what your colonies are telling you. You can't go mark on the calendar today when you're going to start next year. You may have thought my answer was facetious, but it really does depend yeah. on lots of things. Yeah, I, I understand that. Yeah, not speak, uh, speaking from what we, we found out at the lab, <coughs> which is, um, you know, I promote people to, I, 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 I encourage people to read books, but you, but you want to kind of question these numbers that you see in these Queen Mary books. So, you know, it used to be that we talked about 14 days to, from the time of emergence to the gain sexual maturity. Uh, we now believe that one, the, it takes longer for them to reach, at least here, or at least in, around the College Station area, it actually takes longer for them to reach sexual maturity than the book may tell you. You know, whether this is amount of climate change or nutrition, we don't know, but the other factor, we, we, we had documented sperm viability uh, via the lab, and we found out that there is considerable variation in sperm viability in these drones depending upon the season. So it's, it, you know, it probably goes back to what Clint's saying with, you know, you see it, 
if you see the right kind of pollen coming, one, all pollen is not created equal. And, but if you see good pollen coming into the hive, you probably have a pretty good nutritional level. Uh, but when you start seeing these, this year, it seems like we've got a season that's been up and down. And every time the season's gone down, the, the drone viability numbers have suffered in the process. So, you know, it's kind of hard to give you, you know, a date to start when you, you know, you know you're going to have this variation. And if you, if you graft on February the 1st, the queens may come out fine, but if you graft on February the 7th, they may turn out terrible. Uh, so, not easy. It's a, it, it, if it was easy, everybody would do it. On a less scientific note, I'm more of like a farm boy. If you want, <laughs> if you want queens by the middle of April, graft accordingly, and see if you can get some mated queens. I, you're going to get some successfully mated queens. Maybe not as many as you want. Maybe more than you want. But just try it. See what happens. That's what I usually tell people. Just go for it. Yeah, what is the allure? Do we have it early, early, early? early, early. What is... Eat the swarm? Do we all know, Clint, uh, when these queens come back that they're well mated or not well mated? Yeah. Come in. Well, you've said let's graft some queens and you'll get some good ones and you won't get some good ones. How do you tell that this queen's great and this one isn't? Yeah, if you have a mating newt and you have a queen that's laying gangbusters, well, you know you got a good one. So you got you got to wait. Off good. You have to wait and see, is what you're saying. I need to make a comment here. You know, one of the most important things about bee breeding and raising queen bees is the ultimate authority is Mother Nature. And the quality of your stock is dependent on Mother Nature. Now, you can manipulate her a little bit, and we all do that. Uh, with feeding the bees, feeding the drones, healthy drones are very important. A well-fed drone flies at a lower temperature than a starving drone. I have no documentation to prove that, but I can assure you, if you feed your drones the day they're going to go out and mate, there's more of them out there mating with your queens. But Mother Nature is the ultimate authority. And bee breeding, you start, personally, I start slow in the spring. If I'm going to have 10 cell boilers, my first graph, I'll only have a couple because there's so much involved in that, gathering bees, gathering brood, making sure there's pollen, feeding everything, uh, making sure your breeder queens are isolated and they're well fed. So I start slow and you build into it. And by the third week of grafting, I'm probably at full production. But I think we would probably all agree that the least, uh, the least of our queens are the earliest ones. The later queens are better because it's warmer. And, and Mother Nature provides that for you. So, uh, you know, like they say, every year is different. And uh, Daniel said the year has gone by. I always, I'm from out west, and we always used to try to graft by the middle of February. But in Texas, I think that's a little early. I think I was premature this year. So. I started on the 14th this year. Yeah. Was, yeah, that's. Uh, yeah. And then it took off. yeah. So it's dependent on the year. Yes, sir. Of course, I'm not. I've got a question I think is a little weird, but with being a master gardener and being around the Earth Society, they garden and plant by the moon. Has anybody done a study on the effects of the lunar as far as the moon's extraction? That sounds like oh. Keith's question. <laughs> the question is, do the bees work by the moon or something? Actually, one of, the, one of the Asiatic species does fly and, and mate at night. But that's over there, not here. So, I, I, but to, to get the hardier question, the phases of the moon or something, I am completely ignorant of any studies of that. Oh, that, that he knows. I've got, I've got an anecdotal account. <laughs> <laughs> he was up at the full moon one month. <laughs> it does have an effect on my queen crew. Yes. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> I don't think we want to progress that one any further. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Watching your queens as they lay before you cage them and hand them off to a uh, Particularly, is it different in a mini versus a regular? Mm, yeah, so I, I think there's some really good work out of Australia that demonstrates that if you leave a queen in a mating nuke for three weeks, that that queen will be more likely to be accepted and be more likely to head a productive colony than a queen that's caught right after she begins laying in the mating nuke. Now, for commercial queen breeders, that is too long to make economic sense. We can't wait that long. However, we like to leave our queens in the mating nukes, particularly in those early queens, and we start off slow, just like Art does. We like to leave them down for 17, 18 days in that mating nuke before we catch the queen. Okay, we're not catching her on day 14. Later in the spring, as drone numbers ramp up, as resources become available to build the colony faster, populations grow, we will reduce the length of time we leave them in the nuke before we catch them. Now, as, as well, I'm sorry. No, you go ahead. <coughs> as big queen breeders, are y'all supplemental feeding or y'all depending on nature? I know you're feeding sir. We feed sir. I'm mean, throwing sir out there. Are y'all open feeding pollen? I'll, natural pollen I'll feed pollen supplements as well. Just a, just a hammer. Just I, because I want to. I avoid pollen supplements at all costs. That tells you exactly what to do, right? <laughs> <laughs> this time of year I'm pulling honey and I'm working my bees and I'm pulling frames of pollen uh, out of my colonies and I save it and I put it back into them in January. That's uh, the but, way to do it if you're going to save pop. That's the way to do uh, it. I feed, I take a frame of honey or a frame of empty frame out of my brood nest and I put it in a frame of pollen. So I like to have 30 boxes of pollen ready for January and I start putting the pollen in them before the elms this year. I put them in there on the 1st of January. And as far as the bee breeding thing, we start grafting in February, but I start prepping them bees right after Christmas. Uh, I stimulate my bees. I feed them sugar syrup, and it's not so much that they need to feed, but they need the warmth. You know, feeding a gallon of sugar syrup to a beehive when it's 40 degrees outside raises the temperature inside the hive by 30 degrees in an hour. They'll break clusters. They start getting the syrup off of each other and they create heat. And when I'm feeding bees in January, what I'm really doing is stimulating them. <coughs> waking them up, say, get up, boys, let's get going. Yes, yeah, it's soon to be spring. So I, I would say, at least in Central Texas, you get no bang for the buck out of feeding pollen supplements. Now, if you're, if you're doing like Justin Russell is and you're sending bees to California for the almond <coughs> pollination and you start feeding pollen supplements and syrup, in the fall of the year with the idea of pushing population to reach some kind of scaling it makes sense but but actually what i at least where i am actually just as a hive can become honey bound it can become pollen bound there's so much you know we live you know we, me and danny and clint whether they know it or not we live in a pretty unique part of the area of the country where the pollen diversity is really way on the top and you can, you know, you pull one of these frames out, it's solidly, massively covered with yellow and orange and green and every color of pollen you can imagine. You know, we really do have a great diversity in pollen here. And, and I, anyway, I have fed pollen in the past, but I have determined it's better for me to spend money on syrup than to spend money on pollen. Okay. Does research tell you anything on that? Sorry, what? Does it research tell you anything on feeding pollen versus... No, wait a minute. Pollen or pollen? Pollen substitute, substitute versus pollen. Substitute. <coughs> they invariably prefer natural pollen. I mean, consumption is hands down better with, with natural pollen. They can't, even, they can't even digest some of that snake oil that's out there on the market. With I mean, all due respect to it. These didn't evolve any chicken egg yolks. 
<laughs> like well, well. Uh, yes, ma'am. So, so the pollen degrades um, by age and probably by exposure. So if it's in the freezer, it will last longer as a nutritious food. But what is that length of time? Does anybody know how long can you keep it in the freezer before you're just taking up space? <coughs> Yeah, like depends, on how cold, depends on how cold your freezer is, okay? And you, it, you're better off if you can dehumidify it before you freeze it. Because what will happen is, is that you'll get fungal growth on the pollen that rapidly degrades it. So, so how do you store your pollen? Well, I don't know the name of the word, but I store it in boxes and stacks in, in a cool room. Uh, I'm trying that cool room thing this year, but I use them crystals he's always talking about to keep the wax moth and the hive beetles out of it. That works efficiently. Uh, what, the paradichlorobenzene? The para yeah, paradichlorobenzene crystals, and I put it in shop towels in every second or third box, and I just stack them up, even if it's hot. Uh, it keeps the wax moth and the hive beetles out of it, but you gotta restack them and do them every couple of weeks. What temperature is your cool room? My cool room, I'm trying to get it down to maybe 60, 70 degrees. But theoretically, I think if you're going to keep uh, hive beetles and uh, wax moth out of comb, you'd have to get it around 40 degrees. And that's, that's, that's my goal. I'm just starting beekeeping in Texas, and I'm just building this stuff. So. Uh, I'm going to have a cool room where I can put a hundred boxes of honey and pollen and comb in there. Small little room, but I'm going to run it down to 40 degrees for 20 hours every week or so. That should keep all that stuff under control. And, th and this is not trapped pollen, right? This is pollen in the comb. comb. Right? Pollen in the so, comb. And the reason that works better is because the bees will glaze the top of that pollen with a cap of honey that will suppress bacterial growth and fungal growth. So you don't need to get it as cold to keep it viable or <coughs> full of protein and non-degraded. I'd say one more thing. Wax moth and hive beetles are after the pollen that's in the combs. That's what they attack, especially the wax moth. Uh, and another thing a lot of people don't know that honeybees will starve to death on pollen. You know, people tell me all the time, new beekeepers, about well, bees are making a lot of pollen. That doesn't mean anything. The, every colony of bees I've ever starved to death, and that's a considerable number, mind you, <laughs> that have lots of pollen in them. He's laughing. He's done it too. <laughs> okay, folks, I think it's 4.20 almost, and you all have raffle tickets, right? 420? Is that a magic number? <laughs> 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 <laughs>